Couldn't sleep. Me neither. I'm really gonna miss this place. Yeah. Remember when we first came here? We were on our way out to the countryside to find a nice farm. Maybe we still can. Whatever. It's gonna be a big adventure. Did you ever read Peter Pan? Saw the movie once. Why? That's what he said. It's going to be an awfully big adventure. Only... He was talking about dying. Welcome to episode 51 of Conversation on Eagle Mountain, a podcast about the tribe. I'm your host, Lance, and joining me on the podcast panel today is Liz. Hello. Sabine. Hi. And Carlin. What up? We have episode notes done by Matt and myself. So episode 51, the screenplay was done by Anthony Reed. It was directed by Costa Boats. And the episode synopsis were read out by Sabine. Prompted by Jack's insistence and Tysan's vision, which seems to confirm his hunch, the mall rats agree to leave their home for Eagle Mountain. At the locals' headquarters, Bray attempts to convince Ebony to leave the notorious gang and come back to the mall with him. Her feelings on the topic change drastically when Spike initiates his own coup. As the remaining mall rats begin to leave, Amber finally is ridden off her feelings for Bray, but Trudy may not let her give up this easily. Okay, so the episode kicks off with a full-on debate between various members of the tribe as to the validity of Jack and Tysan's combined insistence that both the coordinates and the dream must mean something. The arguments leap from one mindful to the next as the tribe discuss Tysan's firm beliefs, the practicality of undertaking a 30-mile journey into the unknown, and this prospect of leaving everything behind. So yeah, panel, what did you make of all the sides of this debate? And do you think that this scene managed to portray the huge leap of faith that the Morats would have to be making here? I thought it was very relatable and well argued among everybody. Um, I have a mountain, Mount Washington. It's like a two, three hour drive away from here. And I can't imagine having to trek there on foot because... Mm -hmm the coordinates showed up in some important files and that's all I've got to go on. You know, it's like maybe the zombie virus is there, but I, I don't, you want us to walk there? You know, um, we have a safe haven in the middle of this chaotic world and we're about to leave it. We have no idea what's going to be out there. We don't know what's going to be on top of this mountain waiting for us. It does sound insane. And yet, at the same time I get like, it can't be a coincidence that, Tyson dreamed about the same place that Jack did. And it's not like she heard him talk about it. She wasn't in the room when they were discussing it. So this popped into her head on its own. Um, that, you know, it's like, okay, we came to the same solution with very two, two different, you know, problem solving here. I wouldn't be able to ignore that entirely. So I, I really like the debate about it. And um, I don't know what I would have done. I'm going to be honest here. I don't know what I would have done here. I think myself, I would have probably um, understood what Jack was going on about. Found it a big coincidence that Tysan thought the same. But on the other hand, it's the only option. I Means staying there and waiting for everyone to die or attack them all again isn't really an option either. So, yeah, while I get why they have to argue about it, I agree with Lex for once. They're just finding excuses. I agree with that. I think... Them going to Eagle Mountain is the only option that they have right now because at the point you're just sitting around waiting to die or waiting for someone, some other tribe to take advantage of you. But at the same time, I don't really, I mean, if Tizen would have came to me saying that she had a dream about something and we should act on it, I would be very hesitant because I know Tizen normally doesn't tell the truth to people or likes to bend the truth in order to make sure she gets what she wants out of the situation. So, but I, I mean, I would have went to Eagle Mountain too, because that's literally the only thing, the only option we have left. What I thought was interesting was uh, Amber's reaction. You have Jack, when he first brings up, we got to go to this place. Um, you know, nobody wants to go. It's not enough. He doesn't have any answers for what might be there. Uh, so they're just like, forget it. It's ridiculous. We're not doing it. And, um, 
when and then Tysand, like I dreamt of this, blah blah blah. And that changes most of everyone else's minds. But I found Amber's reaction very interesting. She wrote off Jack. And then when here's Tysand confirming that Jack may be onto something and it's, you know, getting other people convinced that maybe they should go. And Amber's adamant that they shouldn't. And she she just she keeps painting it as if it's only Tysand's idea. Like why should we listen to Tysan? She's always crazy. She's always making things up. She's just, she's very toxic here. And I thought it was interesting that she's complete, conveniently leaving out that, no, this isn't Tysan's idea. She's not the only one who came up with it. Jack did too. That's the point everyone's trying to make. And I was wondering, like, why is Amber so adamant against seeing sense here? Um, why is she being so negative about this? And I, I wondered, I was just, I'm just spitballing here, but... I couldn't help but wonder if Amber does not want to leave the mall because once she does, there's no chance of her seeing Bray again and making things right between them. Like, is she clinging to this fantasy, even though she's mad at him, even though she thinks he cheated on her, is she clinging to this fantasy that he's going to come home and he's going to say the right thing and everything will be better? And if they actually leave, he can't do that. I disagree with you on that. I think Amber is now at a point that he's given up on Bray, but also at the idea of life and going places and doing anything at all. She's just, she doesn't want to go, she doesn't want to do anything, let alone trek 30 miles. But I think it has more to do that she's given up on Bray and given up on, well, life, kind of. I can see both sides of that. I mean, we've definitely seen Amber being all misery loves company and try to uh, try to bring everyone down, but... Mm -hmm. She is a bit of a, ro a romantic when it comes to it. So maybe subconsciously, I can see that, you know, she wants to stay for, for Bray or for something, something to happen. Uh, I, I just don't know what. As I was just thinking the night before they finally decided, OK, we're going to do this. And um, before she starts packing her bag, she sits on the bed and she holds his keys. And so it's like her reluctance to leave seems to have way more to do with him than any fear of what's out there because he's who she's thinking about in that moment and then she finally puts the keys down and starts packing like fine this isn't going to happen i'm not going to get my fairy tale ending with him i don't know where he is he's not coming back i just got to move on i just wonder it's just a thought because when i was young and i a boyfriend and i would break up over some mis misunderstanding or whatever no matter how mad i was even if i was the one who did the breaking up i would hang on to this fantasy that he really loved me he would try to make things right. He'd like come back to me and I don't know, beg forgiveness or, <laughs> or whatever. Just pull a pretty woman, you know, and it's just like, oh my gosh, he loved me after all. And of course, now I have the opportunity to take him back. And <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but if she still had the idea in her head that Bray might come back to her, I think she would have responded differently towards Trudy at the moment when they did leave. When she asked, well, you know, shouldn't we... No, I was, just, I was just throwing it out there. Like, that was what she was yeah. hanging on to until she's like, no, there's no point in hanging on to that. He betrayed me, so let that fantasy go. Just a thought. <laughs> she's good at holding a grudge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I, I kind of agree with that. I think because she's lost her belief, and then you have Tyson there who's like... <laughs> Grinning to the group that, oh yeah, I killed myself and Lex. And so it obviously puts her back up and she's like, no, this is ridiculous. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not going to believe this. So uh, yeah, I can kind of see it. <laughs> I see both sides. <laughs> well, we briefly touched on it just then, but like, do you think it's an either or scenario? Like, do they, do they have to go to Eagle Mountain or do they have to stay and die? Do you think there's any other thing that they could have tried or done? I think that at this point they've exhausted all their other options. Mm. That's exactly I mean, what I was going to say. <laughs> I mean, they can't outrun this virus. It's not like they can just run to Alice's farm and ask her if she needs people to help her. You know, it's not like they can go hide over there because they know this virus, it doesn't stay in one place. Yeah, the fact that it mutated and came after them is mm -hmm. proof you can't ignore it. I mean, sure, you can, but for how long, you know? Yeah, it's only a matter of time before, even if they would just stay inside the mall, it's only a matter of time before they run out of food and have to venture outside and risk catching it and infecting everyone. Mm -hmm. 
So no, I, I really think they had no choice but to leave, but to try and find a way out of this mess. I'll say this, if Lex hadn't survived from the prototype, mm -hmm. if, it hadn't, if it hadn't saved his life, then I'd understand there being no point. Yeah, I can understand it's just feeling like, what are we going to find there? We went to Hope Island. We almost died doing that. It did nothing, you know. Um, but because Lex did survive, you, I couldn't ignore that spark of hope. What we found there saved him. We must be on to something, you know. And the only thing stopping us is us. And we can. We can just quit. But who knows what will happen in the future? Like, why not keep pulling on the string? There might be something there. I don't want to keep living in this fear of this thing coming back for me. So uh, I do think it'd be different if what they found in Hope Island hadn't worked at all. Yeah, because they're on the right track. Exactly. They're on the right track. And they've been able to find answers nobody else apparently did. You know, I, I don't know if I could resist continually pulling on that string. I need that hope. <laughs> I gotta try. I would just need to know. Yeah, I agree. I mean, a lot of factors do go into it. They don't really have much of a choice, and it was because of what they found on uh, on Hope Island that was the reason why they went to Eagle Mountain. Although, I would think that they would be a little bit more hesitant as well <laughs> from going to Hope Island and seeing like a bunch of, like a minefield and then, uh, what was it, like a a fail safe of the whole island blowing up if someone got the virus or got the antidote. So I'm surprised no one talked about that either, saying that, hey, one of us could actually die if we if we go up there. <laughs> yeah, but who would say that? Amber is the only one who could basically throw that out there. I mean And Dell. Yeah, mm -hmm. and Dell. But I mean Dell already wants to go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're right. They have no choice, but I'm, I'm just, it's very curious. I'm just curious on why no one brought that up. I think it's more that the others did not know. They don't know what exactly happened on Hope Island. Mm, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I guess I can see that. I know. I think maybe I would go. Like, I'm sitting here thinking, like, do I stay in my house and just hope the zombies don't get in here and get me? <laughs> And that what I'm doing to survive will continue, despite my survival being threatened several times in just the last week? Or do I take a chance and find the cure for the zombie bite? I mean, I would go too. I would definitely go. Mm -hmm. Because I definitely, I feel like it would be a nightmare if, if I was in the <laughs> tribe and everyone died from the virus. And the only one alive is like me and Bob. And it's like a Will Smith, I am legend type ordeal. <laughs> hey, I, I don't hike and even I'd go. I feel like I'd have to go while there was still a chance. Yeah. Like I, something would, I would just, something in me would feel like if I don't go, if I just keep hoping I can keep up the status quo, things are just going to get worse. If anything, mm -hmm. this week has taught me is that I, you know, we thought we had it all together. And look at all the disasters that have befallen us in just a short period of time. We are living on the cusp. We got comfortable and we forgot that all it takes is one little catastrophe to completely screw us over. All mm -hmm. it took was one tribe to come in here and eat our food, to hit us to the point, the brink of starvation, not having anything. You know, um, that's how we're living. Do we want to continue doing that and pretending everything's fine or do we go out? And, and find a way to stop this. I don't know. I, I just, I'd have to go. I'd be scared. I'd totally load my pants, but I'd do it. I think you have a good point there. With the recent attack, they finally realized that, no, they can't beat other tribes. They're not invincible. And, you know, they, they've seen how easy it is to get taken over by other people, to have no say in the matter. And I think that helps them to just decide to go for it. Because they know their home's not safe from invaders. Or the well, virus. Yeah. Well, when you say it like that, that's not much of an option of, hmm, should I try and fight off another tribe with pillows mm -hmm. that are going to attack me or make my way to Eagle Mountain? It's an easy choice. I mean, you say that, but there is one other option like that no one brings up. But like, They could leave the city and go somewhere else. Yeah, but where? They know they cannot outrun this forever. The adults couldn't. Exactly. They've w that's the thing we keep forgetting. These kids have already witnessed the virus take out the world. 
you know, this is not like their first time experiencing it and have all these hopes that, oh, maybe I just won't get it. They watch this thing kill everyone. Mm hmm. And just like Sabine says, they already know they can't outrun it. Sure, Lex is the only one who technically got sick this time. What about next time? They could all have it by now. You know, I, it's not the same. I, granted, I agree. Like, I wish the kids had left the city a long time ago, Lance. And <laughs> after a while, it's like, why are you guys still here? But that clearly isn't the way they think. I guess. <laughs> Um, they needed an incentive to leave the city. They needed this thing to make them actually leave their safe haven and venture out because they're scared of venturing out there. Every time a few of them decide to, horrible things happen to them. You know, they get sold into slavery. They get tricked into prostitution. It just, nobody wants to leave the city. They're all terrified of doing it. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> well, well, maybe Lance is on to something. There, there have been tribes that have just left the city and have done quite well for themselves, even though there is a virus out there, such as like the Chosen and the uh, the Eco Tribe, for one. So, I mean, they haven't gotten any of the virus, and they've done pretty, or any of the antidotes. The Chosen done did. Fine. Well, that's like one guy, though, wasn't it? Yeah, we'll get to the weird season two virus bit later. What's important yeah. is that these kids don't know that. They, they don't know, know that there are going to be people who that, that they don't know that this virus won't affect everyone. They don't know that yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At this point in time, they have every reason to believe that every single one of them is going to get it eventually mm -hmm. because yeah. that's what they saw. So they can't outrun this. They can't hide from it. Even if they go into the country, it'll get them eventually. So if you're going to leave, you might as well leave trying to save the world or at least yourself. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean you guys are right it's just like yeah it's just a massive leap of faith to take huge huge mm -hmm. but it's dying or having a chance at survival those are their options yeah but some people dying isn't the scariest thing yeah it's not I the mean, worst thing that can happen to you yeah losing your loved ones and friends along the way could be worse mm -hmm. i mean think about it you got to look at it from a devil's advocate point of view Yes, they could likely die in the mall. If this virus behaves like the one that killed their parents, it's going to kill them here in the mall. Mm -hmm. Okay? So they have a choice of dying in the mall or dying, taking a chance out in the wilderness, not knowing what they'll run into. For some people, the comfort of dying at home and knowing what to expect, they would prefer it. They would prefer to be at home, of surrounded by the things that make them comfortable, surrounded by the people they love, and say, you know what, at least I know what to expect here. This is the way I'd rather go <laughs> compared to out there when I don't know what else could happen to me. I'll still die, but it could be horribly out there, you know? I'm not saying I agree with that. I'm just saying that for some people, that is far more comforting. <laughs> it's like if you have cancer and it's like, well, there's an experimental thing you could do in, you know, out in France, and you have a person go, you know what? I just want to go home. I want to die with my family. I don't want to spend my last weeks fighting and searching for some cure. I just want to go home. Mm -hmm. Aren't you nervous about leaving here? I am. Yeah? Yeah. Really, really nervous. But you'll look after me, won't you? Sure. Me and Lex, we'll look after everybody. Of course you will. I'll always look after you, Celine, if you want me to. Always? Um, we'll come back to this in a little bit, but um, I want to talk about the scene at night between Celine and Ryan, because it did bug me, I have to say. Um, <laughs> so at night, Celine approaches Ryan and confesses that she is scared about leaving them all and their uncertain future. And she begs Ryan to look after her, as well as telling him that she wants to spend the night and seals his promise with a kiss yeah panel what did you make of celine here um and the kind of what i felt was backtracking from the growth she had begun to show of looking out for each other rather than him just looking out for her i think in this moment she just reverts back to being the scared girl who doesn't know what the future might hold and i can make, yeah i can kind of understand her in that because well it is scary and you know, Ryan is the guy who is most likely to protect her. Mm. But I think she knows exactly what she's doing. 
this is what when she just tried to seal yes. that <laughs> <laughs> it felt like she knew exactly what she was doing she's yeah. like yeah i'll spend the night here's a kiss like oh, it, it, she, yeah she knows what she's doing <laughs> i didn't like it i didn't like it <laughs> no she, she, she's just going i want his protection because that will make me feel safe and well at least he he needs to know that i like him or at least he needs to think that i like him that way so he will protect me no matter what mm. it's smart it's calculated if i was her i'd probably have done the same thing <laughs> and i know that sounds yeah. horrible <laughs> i mean i think selena is sensing the end is near so she's pretty much just taking her shot with, with ryan because you never know what's going to happen tomorrow's never promised I don't know if it's backtracking, but I, I completely see where you're coming from, Lance. You know, um, it's definitely consistent with Celine, though. I mean, Celine does do that. She hop, uh, hopscotches between, you know, I'm an independent woman. You don't need to take care of me, Ryan. Get out of my face. You're smothering me. Mm -hmm. I think I'm incapable to, Ryan, what am I going to do? I need you. I can't do this without you. Um, so it feels very honest to her character when she tells him this, like, I'm scared. Mm -hmm. um, I actually like that she's being so forward with Ryan about this, where she's not pretending that, hey, I'm Miss Independent, I got it. Like, she's just being straight with him. Are you scared? Because I seriously am. Like, when he says he's, she doesn't pretend to not be afraid. She just straight out tells him, I'm scared and I need you. You know what I mean? Like, I need mm -hmm. I, you know, when I'm feeling strong, I'll take care of you too. But right now I'm not feeling strong and I really need you to take care of me. And um, being honest about what she needs from him, I, I do like that. Um, and I also love the fact that Ryan at first does not want to misconstrue what she's asking of him. So he's like, mm -hmm. oh, don't worry, Lex and I will take care of everyone. But then he looks at her and realizes what she's asking and makes sure to clarify, I will always look after you. I don't want you to be insecure about that. You know, like I won't do it because it's me and Lex's job. I will do it because I care about mm -hmm. you. And I kind of feel like that's why she kisses him. This understanding between them that yes, Ryan is the guy who will look after everybody. Like she doesn't owe him anything. He'd do it anyway, but he wants her to know I will protect you because of you, because I care about you, not just because mm -hmm. that's what I do. And her thanking him like that means something to me. And I care about you too. Um, but I completely understand why it can look calculated because of what we know about Celine and Ryan and what happens with their relationship. Um, there are many times when I feel like Celine's actions with Ryan are calculated and even manipulative. I can't say I feel that here. Um, because they're still in that beginning where I feel like their relationship is based on honesty and sincerity and actually has promise, but um I can't argue that <laughs> I can't say that you're wrong for feeling that way at all, <laughs> but I didn't feel it. That's not what I got from this. It just felt like one of the true moments between Ryan and Celine, getting each other, understanding each other, being honest with each other about what they need, what they require from each other. And I don't know. I thought it was kind of beautiful in a way. I wish it, it doesn't continue all the time and that sucks, but <laughs> in this moment all by itself, I did think it was beautiful, I guess. I, I think I kind of feel like the moment with Sandra earlier on a couple of episodes back does affect how Celine acts right now. Because, okay, Lex is back, so Lex can take care of Sandra. And Celine wants to make sure that this time around, Ryan is taking care of her that sees his priority. Yeah, I do think that that plays through her mind. It could. It definitely could. Um, think about it. From Celine's point of view, Ryan started to take care of her. And she started to show some strength. Like, she was responding well mm -hmm. to his care, but also doing well on her own. So the minute Zandra required help, what did Ryan say to her? Zandra needs me more. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to lie. There could be some truth in what you're saying. Because she was trying to show Ryan that she could be strong on her own, she may have felt like he abandoned her. Like, oh, well, if I have to choose, Celine doesn't need me as much as Zandra does. He even said that to her. Mm -hmm. You don't need me the way she does. So maybe Celine feels like I need to tell him that I need him. Instead of pretending I have my shit together, he needs to know, I don't right now. I'm terrified. Please do not leave me to take care of someone else because I need you to take mm -hmm. care of me. 
me. And Ryan getting that and letting her know that, I get it. I see what you're asking me. I'll always take care of you. So there could be truth in what you're saying. Definitely. I just like the fact that Selena is being honest with Ryan about what she freaking wants from him right now. For yeah. what's in her life. Well, instead of leaving this poor guy to double guess and kick himself, not knowing what, what does she want, I'll give it to her. She just won't tell me. <laughs> I kind of disagree on that. I don't think she is being quite clear what she wants. She's like, I mean, okay, on the one hand, she's saying, oh, yeah, I want you to protect me. But then she's like, yeah, I want to spend the night. And she, I'll, and she kisses him. He's like, yeah, we're going to. I'm going to sell you to this. I, I'm, no, I don't think she is being completely clear. I don't know. <laughs> Lance is like, I wouldn't know what she wants from me. <laughs> she's, she's, like, she's saying, yeah, um, I want you to protect me. She's not saying, I like you. I, I feel for anything for you. She's saying, oh, yeah, I, want, I just want you to protect me. And I'll spend the night and kiss you to make sure this happens. I, no, I'm not mm-hmm. quite seeing the lovely scene that you're getting your scene, Liz. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fair man <laughs> mm, yeah. to all the Ryan and Celine shippers I tried <laughs> I tried to fight for you <laughs> it's a smart and calculated move on Celine's part though <laughs> yeah I can't help but feel that <laughs> it's just very yeah <laughs> I gotta take the L on this one <laughs> uh. Um, for one couple to the next, though, um, what did you feel about, um, just quickly, like, Dal calming a frantic Jack who feels the huge weight of responsibility on his shoulders? <laughs> Sorry, I love that you referred to that as for one couple to the next. It, it's, it's, it's just kind of, kind of at this point. It's just, it's just a myth. Don't fight it! <laughs> I love the fact that Dal, when Jack goes, what if everyone dies and it's my fault? And Dal doesn't say anything like, oh, that wouldn't happen. He's like, well, if it does, no one can blame you. It's fine. Uh, I love that moment between those two. He's just so practical. I love it. He's just, yeah. Because if he had said, we won't die, Jack, that wouldn't have calmed Jack down. <laughs> nope. have been like, oh, what if no. we do, Dal? We could. Dal is simply agreeing with him. Yes, you're right. We could. But at that point, there's no one to point the finger. So you're fine. <laughs> Dal knows how to talk to his man. He knows. Mm-hmm. I, I, I love that conversation with, you know, Dal's like, well, it wasn't, we're not just doing it because you said something. You know, Tyson had her vision as well. And Jack's like, that's what bothers me because <laughs> her, her way of getting to here is so beyond anything I can possibly understand. And, I don't respect it, and I'm actually insulted by what she does. So how could she come up with the same answer as me? And then Dal telling him, yeah, but you did it with logic. So, you know, I, I just, I love the whole conversation between those two. They're a fun couple to watch. That they are. You know it would be really funny? If Celine got advice from Dale about, like, relationship advice, and then, like, what should I do with Ryan? And then Dale's like, oh, well, this is what I do with Jack. And then she, she went to go to mess the scene with, with Celine and Ryan. Um, yeah, um, sticking with that night. Um, yeah, Bannon, what did you make of um, the flashbacks experienced by Amber as um, she thinks back to how far the tribe have come? Like, did it kind of impart the idea that this was going to be like the end? of the time in the mall for you or like, what, what were you expecting when you kind of felt that i feel like it emphasizes especially for a young viewer where it might go over their head what's happening here it emphasizes what they're leaving this is their home this mm-hmm. is their safe haven it's the one place in the world they have and that's what they're leaving they're not going to be able to just come back if something happens to them out on the road once they leave the chances of them coming back become very slim because they have no idea what's waiting for them and i think seeing them in this home helps a younger audience get what they're leaving behind Mm -hmm. that oh i don't think they're going to be able to come back you know they're leaving it for good they're not going on a day trip you know um so i and it hit me in the gut you know just a nice reminder of what these kids have been through in this shelter what it's been to them and what they formed under this roof and leaving that behind to who knows what'll be there, what they could be losing going out there. It's a powerful moment. Yeah, I really don't have anything to add to that. 
Um, when I initially first watched it, I thought that one, I thought it was a beautiful scene and it kind of, uh, made me realize what a home is like for them, like for the mall, because at first it was just some place to take shelter from the first episode. And then from episode to episode, it came a place where, you know, they had laughs and cries and, and arguments and, and, you know, physical arguments, physical fighting and all that stuff that to the point where a family was formed there. And if they leave it, you, you know, you don't really know what's going to happen to them. So I thought it was awesome. And it totally let me realize because I've been binging the whole episodes. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm at the season finale or the season finale is, is going to come up. So. Yeah, it totally let me know that everything that they, you know, form with the tribe is going to come to the ultimate test pretty soon. It's like if these walls could talk, the stories they would tell, you know, when you walk into a place like that, what happened there? If the walls could talk and tell you the stories, the things, the life that lived there, you know? Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, it was quite nice to have... Amber and Dow bookmark that scene by having a little conversation about remember when we first came and we were about to leave together. Mm -hmm. It does kind of put it into this perspective like, yeah, this is this is the beginning of the end. <laughs> yeah, it spells a certain level of doom mm -hmm. when shows do that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a nice reminder that the tribe was a happy little accident. Mm -hmm. None of them planned this. This isn't what any of them were really mm -hmm. trying to get. And yet it turned out to be exactly what they all needed going to be an awfully big adventure only he was talking about dying mm -hmm. that's a peter pan quote yep. yeah the disney fan in me <laughs> had to appreciate that because to live is an awfully big adventure but it also means death it's quite funny hearing that now knowing what we know happens in <laughs> mm -hmm. i have to admit it's stuff like this that, that i don't know what i i always wonder like did the writers know at the end of season one that Beth wasn't coming back, that they were going to be killing her off because the writing in season two doesn't feel like they knew that, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And so I do wonder what were their goal? What was their goal for this? They want us to have this doomed feeling, the sense of apprehension, what's going to happen to everybody. And it's like, so was that just for tone, yeah. you know? So much foreshadowing. But for what? Because when, yeah. again, when you look at the writing of season two, it does, to me that they knew amber that they were killing her off it was like oh crap we've already written this for yeah. her and now we have to kill her off maybe they knew zondra was going to die who knows but i just mm -hmm. kind of wonder what was going on in their minds when they were writing this and the tone they were going for that feels so ominous and just oh is it just so that we it gets our blood pumping or because they're actually mm -hmm. going to you know i don't know maybe it's just for the sense of adventure who knows it is, but in hindsight, it's perfect. Yeah, absolutely. It's actually really sobering in hindsight. So many things they say depress the crap out of me knowing what happens. I've been thinking about what you said earlier about Lex. Yeah? You really think he could have made it? But all I know is that the stuff he had was our best shot. From Hope Island, not from some street corner snake oil salesman. Can you believe those guys fallen for that? They're starting to panic. Maybe. No, not maybe, for sure. Come on, Ebony. How long do you think you're going to have control over them? What do you mean? That's what's really bothering you, isn't it? No way. I'm their leader, and they worship me. For how long? All right, let's um, leave them all for a moment and head to the hotel because we see a livid Ebony who is ashamed pretty much that Spike has been fooled by an obvious antidote scam in the city. Later, Ebony wakes Bray in the middle of the night and he sees just how desperate she is and how the panic is beginning to set in. So yeah, um, panel, um, what did you make of this glimpse into Ebony's insecurities and the slow loss of power that we witness within the locos? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just like, Ebony, what was your plan? Like, you're so mad at Spike, but what else did you think was going to happen eventually? These kids are desperate. You haven't given them a direction of what to do about this. Aside from stoning, you know, virus victims. It, it kind of makes me laugh. And hey, at least Spike tried something. 
Yeah. I mean, I again, I get it. Like, dude, you think the ant, you really believe that someone would just be able to make the antidote? It'd be on the street. <laughs> How dumb are you? <laughs> I find right. it interesting, though, the color of the antidotes he brings back. Where did they all get the idea that it should look that way? Good question. Why did that become the default color for fake antidote? Yeah, I mean, why not red? Because that would look <laughs> like, a, uh, like toxic. It would look good to drink. <laughs> apparently, yeah, it's got to be appealing. Like, apparently, urine is the uh, accepted color of yes. medicine <laughs> <That's it. laughs> in our collective yep. consciousness. <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. If I think about liquid medicine I have, it's either white or yellow. Yeah. So, fair point. Imagine if it was like purple or something, you would not want to drink it. It's like, whoa, what's, that's toxic. I don't want to drink it. <laughs> what I'm wondering, now when Bray, you know, starts messing with them and pointing out that what they took from the mall was the closest thing they had to an antidote and that Lex had poured out in the pool. Look at Spike. He seems absolutely shocked. Like he did not know this is what had happened. So it's mm -hmm. like, what do you guys think she was doing with that stuff? You were <laughs> there when they took it from the mall. Okay. And then she made it clear when she took Lex and Bray that she was going to use Lex as a guinea pig. And then she threw him out. Did none of you have any questions about what she was doing and where the stuff had gone? No? <laughs> mm, yeah. They they might have thought that oh Lex was still dying, it didn't work. But yeah, I that would be giving them too much credit, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that whole scene, uh it brought up two things for me. One, it let me know that the locos in general are not really a powerful tribe unless they have a powerful leader you know behind behind them they're a bunch of bullies uh, you know to guide them and whatnot yeah they're a bunch of bullies and they're not very smart uh and then the second thing that uh that came to mind was that the locals really have the tribe the tribe itself is basically useless if it doesn't have power and chaos to go commit if the entire city is full of virus infected kids and there are no kids in the street because they're all dying and there's really nothing to steal because nothing is worth anything then their entire existence as a tribe is kind of pointless yeah they're just a big fist it needs somebody to direct it mm -hmm. but you know that's what zoot wanted in the beginning he wanted people he could that would just do what he wanted them to do yeah, they're, they're nothing without a decent leader. Yeah. Not big thinkers, those logos. Nope. <laughs> no, not at all. I think that might explain why several of them ended up with the Guardian. Someone who could think for them. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're followers, not, not leaders. I think what I really loved about that scene, though, was um, the closeness that Bray seemed to have with Ebony. Mm -hmm. He was like, yeah, I, I know you, Ebony. I know, like, I know what's wrong. I know... <laughs> what you're thinking is like did, did, did it surprise anyone how close the two seem to be absolutely not i nope. thought they were going to confess their love for each other and bray <laughs> would seek the light that you know what i don't think amber is who i love it's you ebony i just like being able to see for ourselves where this relationship had come from you know instead of just telling us that they dated once by showing the way Bray and Ebony do like interact with each other, you can believe they were a couple at one point. Mm -hmm. You can see it. You can see when, like, once upon a time, they were able to work together, that they were able to have an emotional intimacy with each other. They could understand each other. You know, um, I like that. It, it feels real. Like, this was something that actually existed between them. And it just adds to the dynamic energy that Bray and Ebony will always have because you will always get these glimpses of how well they can work together and then one of them always gets in the way of that it's usually Ebony <laughs> <laughs> like you you know I like it they show us why Ebony and Bray could work why they once upon the time did work and then they always remind us why they won't ever work mm -hmm. again and it's usually because of something Ebony does that reminds us that's why this mm -hmm. relationship no 
longer exist. Because you'd be asking, you're just kicking yourself, why don't these two get together again? Then Ebony does something, you're like, oh, that's why. <laughs> that's why they'll never <laughs> be together again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is because Ebony does some some dumb stuff sometimes. but Some? I'll, I mean, <laughs> a lot of it is because Amber is in the middle of it. Amber Can't isn't the reason these two break. aren't together. No. He's not the reason these two aren't together, and you know it. It, it has <laughs> they, to be. <laughs> they were already apart before exactly. Amber, before either of them knew Amber existed. There's been plenty of times Amber has not been in the situation, and Ebony and Bray cannot get to that place again because of Ebony. They, it's just not going to happen. Yeah, I'm all for blaming things on Amber, but this isn't one of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's saying something. She means that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I've blamed her for a lot of things. <laughs> no, I, I do like that though, because Dwayne and Meryl do have really good chemistry and uh, it's so true to life. There are people that it's like one minute you click with them and then you're just like, why can't we get together? And then something happens. You're like, oh, that's why we can't get together. You're a Nazi. I keep forgetting that. Um, <laughs> I do think it was very well timed to put it in in this episode though. Yes, it is because it it makes you start to question if the you know Amber's on to happened, yeah, and if things yeah, happened like, later, if there's any truth to that. Sure, like you're sitting there watching, and you're like, well, Amber, we saw what happened at the pool. It was a misunderstanding, but episodes like this make you start to wonder if, well, huh? I wonder. Oh, uh oh, uh oh. You know, I I think that's smart too. It's. Yeah, really brings your fan base, gets them all invested. Like, no, Bray, don't <laughs> you do it, Bray. With it. <laughs> I, I just keep kept thinking, how far did Trudy downplay this mm. to Amber? <laughs> Was there that much more going on that she's not telling her just to save her feelings? Yeah, <laughs> it, it's nice drama, you know, it's nice, juicy drama, but it doesn't like take away from the story mm -hmm. or the character. It's just nice and intriguing and gives these actors a chance to stretch a bit with each other. And then here goes the Ebony's having this moment where she's reminded that she was always able to be emotionally vulnerable with Bray. And he's accepting of that, unlike everyone else in her life who she has to pretend with all the time. And here she is with Bray. And as soon as she lets down her guard and he, he calls her out, she, what does she do? She, ah, she doubles down. You're not going anywhere. I'm not losing power. And I'm like, Ebony, this is why you're not going to get your boo back. <laughs> <laughs> she wants him to see her, but then she immediately like grows fangs when he does see her. Which, of course, is her defense mechanism, which I get. She reminds me of Nebula with Gamora. Mm, yes. <laughs> you know, when Gamora would try to be like, reach out to her little sister, you know, Nebula would just like bristle. Even though she wanted her little her big sister's attention and affection and care, she would still bristle whenever Gamora would do something to protect her or whatever. I don't need your protection, you know, or whatever. And I just think that's interesting because she had no choice but to become that way because of the abuse she suffered. And Ebony reminds me of that sometimes. Yeah. Definitely. Um, that's definitely Ebony. Product of her environment. For Ebony, vulnerability is an invitation for people to hurt you. Come on, everybody, it's time to go. No, Lex, no, I don't want to. Well, I'm going anyway, you stupid cow. Back in the mall, um, it's now the morning and Tyson calls for everyone to wake up and leave for Eagle Mountain. And yeah, what follows is some slightly chaotic scenes as everyone gets different things together. Um, as they try to decide what to take and what to leave behind. Yeah, Panna, what did you make of those scenes? Typical family road trip. <laughs> and one girl who wants to pack her whole wardrobe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there had to be one. I took a lot of summer trips with like summer camps and stuff like that. And there would always be this big 15 passenger van and we'd all have to take some weekend trip in it. And this is what it sounded like every freaking time. Every time. It's just, it, it's like, oh, it's insanity. But this is exactly what it sounds like. You know the beginning of, like, Home Alone? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it reminded me of, it's like, yeah. Yep. <laughs> grab the clothes, grab the batteries. I, I, Dal just turns up with a pen knife, like, what? <laughs> like, no medicine, no supplies. <laughs> No, nope. chaotic. 
That's all I need. <laughs> there was one scene though. I I, I just want to figure out what you guys were what you think the writer's intentions were here. Like, okay, Zondra wants to take her clothes, and everyone's like, Zondra, don't be an airhead. There's no, you don't need all these clothes. And then Lex is like, leave Zondra alone. If my wife wants to take something, she gets to. I'm not letting you mess with her. Then he looks at what she's <laughs> taking, and he starts throwing her clothes and saying, you don't need this crap. And you got Zondra scrambling around trying to pick up her clothes. Now, what do you guys think the writer's intention was this? Were they going for just, ha-ha, this is kind of funny? Or did this feel a little toxic to you like why <laughs> did they set up the scene to humiliate Zondra with her husband like this it just was it just me or is it just did you just get from it that was kind of funny hmm. I no I agree with you I think it was written as this is kind of funny um, and not specifically as toxic but that might have to do with the amount of years between when it was written and the moment we're watching it now that makes us view it differently that's fair oh, yeah. definitely fair I I can I can see it as humorous, but I also kind of saw it as toxic because um, I believe a, a little bit shortly after that, Lex called her uh, a cow, right? He, he called her something. He called her a cow. He, he called her something, and it just goes to show like how he's not been been very supportive to her in the entire marriage. So, yeah, I thought I could definitely see it as toxic. I just I just caught my attention because you know, I felt like I'm getting the writers trying to show some progress between Lex and Ty uh, Zandra at this point. You know, um, the fact that like Zandra begs him, do not leave me, you know, like don't ruin what we have. Everything is good now. We're together. Please don't mess it up. And Lex seemingly decides to respect her and say, fine, I'm not going to screw things up. But he still needs to get payback on the person who dishonored his wife, you know. Um, so I feel like the writers were trying to make efforts to show that this relationship has come further. Uh, they may deal with things differently, but it's healthier than it used to be. But I just thought that scene kind of was did the opposite. Like maybe it's too soon to show him being a dick to her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I know agree. it's supposed to be funny, but maybe not, you know, because. <laughs> It didn't play off as funny to me. But I think Sabine's right too, because I'm much older now. I'm like, that's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> At that age, it kind of was. <laughs> I remember thinking it was funny years ago too. Like, ha ha ha. You know, he sees why everyone's like, she can't bring this stuff and then throws it. But now I'm like, too soon. <laughs> yeah, that's, you've put a new spit on that. <laughs> <laughs> ah. like, uh, 20 years on that's not as funny now that i see their relationship yeah. as the toxic abusive mess that it was <laughs> maybe you don't need to have him throwing her belongings and her scrambling to pick them up with that awful look on her face yeah definitely it's got a different meaning now yeah <laughs> it does. just a little bit just a little bit <laughs> See, and I used to view it from the light of um, me going on holiday with my family and um, me trying to pack as much stuff as, Son as Sandra is trying and getting a similar response from the rest of the family with a yeah, no. <laughs> you don't need all that junk. So to me, it seemed perfectly normal at the time. Again, like I thought it was funny the first time I saw it, and it wasn't really until today I was looking at it, and it hit me like, I wonder what their intention was, because I don't, I get, I feel like this was supposed to be funny, but seeing their relationship now, and it doesn't feel funny, it just feels kind of mean-spirited. I think it was meant to show that Lex didn't change that much overnight. And that's what's sad. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, I just like I'm I'm not trying to make it more serious than it was. I I'm with you guys. I think it was meant to be just, you know, for a gag, but it is weird looking at it now and like, oh. Huh. I don't find that so funny anymore. <laughs> I okay, I love how um the girls are fussing about, you know, taking their pets and stuff and um Lex finally just gives in and finds a space for the animals. Chloe kisses him and he goes, get off. But do you notice he leans in so Patsy can do it too? Mm, it's so <laughs> cute. <laughs> like, don't kiss me. Go on. Give Uncle Lex a kiss. <laughs> <laughs> Better say thanks. <laughs> I just thought it was really adorable. <laughs> just 
just that age old argument. Everybody wants to bring what's important to them, but what's important to you may not be important to anybody else. And you got to find room for it all in the family station wagon. <laughs> that, that did seem like a bit of a bad thing to carry with them. That whole station wagon or, or what was it like a little wheel cart thing? Yeah. I would have thought they would have just had book bags or something. Huh. I feel like a book bags would have been smarter. Definitely some kind of like trailblazer bags or hiking packs or something. I mean, Trudy's not bringing Brady in a stroller. She's carrying her in a very practical way on her back. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. It, it just seemed like they were resulting back to like that 1600s pilgrim type way of traveling, which in the city's still apart. dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the city's still dangerous. So I would imagine what a trip like that, 30 miles. <laughs> Uh, not knowing who you have to escape from and whatnot, I think the lighter you pack, the better. I seriously think they brought the wagon just so they could have the axle break. Mm-hmm. Like I, I feel like it's, it was just for drama's sake. To they start off with this and then they end up having to carry everything. And what? I don't know. Whatever did they do with those batteries? They're not carrying those. Yeah, conveniently, I don't know where they went. They must have had no choice but to say we're leaving him behind. But it, yeah, it seems kind of crazy. <laughs> Without a fuss from Jack. <laughs> Jack didn't want to carry him. <laughs> Someone probably said, okay, Jack, you can bring the batteries, but you're the one who has to carry him. And he was like, screw it. <laughs> That's funny because he, he was the main one pushing the, the whole cart. <laughs> mm-hmm. Because those batteries were huge. Just bring one. You don't need all of them. Spike, what are you doing here? Get out. No, Ebony. You get out. What? You've gone soft since you brought that Bray guy here. You're out. Says who? Says me. I'm taking over. He got me to deal with first. So, um, yeah, I've got, I got two main questions for you guys here. Like, did it surprise anyone that Bray came to Ebony's aid? And, like, what did you make of that massive smirk on her face when they two ran off together, <laughs> hand in hand? <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> Uh, of course he would help her. Bray cannot resist a damsel in distress. Most of the time. Especially one he loves. <laughs> but yeah, that smirk, it was brilliant. It does really point to home as to why Bray hasn't tried to escape yet. Because like first time I watched, I remember wondering, like, why isn't he just trying to get out of there? You know? Even Lex tried to escape, and he was dying. What are you doing, Bray? But Bray's sitting there trying to reason with Ebony over and over again. And it's like, why aren't you trying? And when he rescues her, it just hits me. Like, that's Bray's bag when it comes to Ebony. He really Mm -hmm. thinks he can get through to her. And he would rather work with her, even if he has all these bitter feelings towards the breakup. And um, so, yeah, I wasn't surprised he saved her. Because I'm like, okay, now that makes sense. Why he hasn't just left. He really thought he could just talk her around to his way of things you know his way of seeing things and um he's asking her just join us or just let me go or whatever and i just thought that was like yeah it says a lot about them and that'll just continue in their relationship forever Bray thinking he can get through to ebony you know and look to this way i do think that bray saw spike's coup coming Mm -hmm. you know he saw her power crumbling He knew it was just a matter of time before they would try to ditch her. And sometimes I feel like he stayed there because he knew how close that was getting. Just to be able to protect her. Possible too. Because there's that small part that, you know, you can't hurt Ebony. He won't let you hurt Ebony. If anyone's going to hurt her, it better be him. Yeah, and he's not there yet where he wants to hurt her. That'll come. But at this point, he still thinks of her almost fondly or at least with some respect. And uh, he still has hope for her at this point. Um, that'll change. <laughs> yeah, but not but she, at this. But yeah, not at, yet. This, at this time she hasn't done anything to make him hate her. She hurt his feelings. She broke his heart, you know. But he he doesn't hate her or anything yet. And her smile when he does save mm-hmm. her, it reminds me of someone who's only living in the moments of a relationship rather mm-hmm. than focusing on what makes a relationship work. Yes. Ebony lives for the moments she and Bray have that can convince her that he still loves her and that the spark is there. But Ebony is, does not want to be bothered what it would take to keep this relationship going. 
you know, she just wants the postcards of this relationship. And for her, this is proof that he still loves her, still wants yeah. her. And she doesn't want to focus on all the other stuff that keeps a, that relationship to go. It's not just the postcards, but that's the only part she wants to focus on. And her face lit up. <laughs> it was just so cute. Yeah, the look on her face was like, I got him. <laughs> He's mine. <laughs> Because he could have totally just sat back, let Spike do whatever he wanted, and just snuck out. Mm -hmm. But instead, he's been waiting on guard, paying attention. He knew he would have to save her eventually. And she's like, and he totally did. Oh my gosh, you love me so much. <laughs> right? It's like, shut up, let's go. <laughs> now I want to picture her all the way to the mall going, you love me. <laughs> shut up, Ebony. <laughs> you know you love me. <laughs> Ah, oh, those two in the mall. <laughs> yeah, um, I, that, that leads on to the next question because, like, does it? Oh, I suppose does it surprise anyone at all that um, Trudy was still not willing to give up on Bray by leaving the message for him? Of course, he left a message for him. Trudy will never give up on Bray. That is what defines their relationship. You know, she will never lose complete faith in him. She'll be hurt by him. She'll doubt him. She'll be angry at him. But she will never give up on him and who she believes him to be. You know, I, so... <laughs> and, Sorry. And other than that, he's her daughter's only other blood relative. True. He's family. He's yeah. family. And He'll family doesn't get left behind. <laughs> That's right. Or forgotten. <laughs> Oh, I love that. I love that Trudy did that. Like, she, you know, she's, this isn't about Amber and Bray in this moment. This is about Bray coming home and finding his family gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she's not going to do that to him. Whatever, maybe he did cheat on Ebony, Amber. Amber. She doesn't, that has, not, has nothing to do with this. What matters is that he has a right to know where his family has gone and she's not going to leave him twisting in the wind. You know, and I like that where for Amber is he cheated on me. So screw him. But for Trudy, it's like he's still our family member. It's not just about yeah. you. Amber. It's not just about what he did to you, quote unquote, you know, um, and just having a little faith in him, giving him the benefit of the freaking doubt, give him a chance to catch up with you and explain himself, you know, <laughs> just anything. I, gold star for Trudy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> But, ah, uh, it so annoyed me when Bray and Ebony walked into that mall. And he calls out for everyone in the mall, except for Trudy. Okay, I'll give you that. <laughs> but, it, no, I got, no, I won't. <laughs> no, you know, I'll just give it to you. You're right. He doesn't call Trudy's name. Like. <laughs> he lists nearly everyone, except for the dog. <laughs> I have to bring up the events outside, because it... Did annoy me so much. <laughs> okay, so let's set the scene. So, having heard about Top Hat's attempted rape of Zanj from KC, Lex and Ryan decide to head after him, completely abandoning the Morats out in the open to fend for themselves against locos and crazies and God knows who else. Um, yeah, panel. <laughs> like. <laughs> Like, did it annoy anyone else that Lex risked so much just to get even and just to satisfy his own ego? <laughs> I didn't expect anything else from him. Mm -hmm. Like, I just, I don't like the way it's written out. Like, okay, the idea, fine, whatever. Maybe Lex would do something that dumb. I just don't like the fact that it's treated as this side quest that we don't get to see. And there's no room for it right now. You know, we, we have a lot going on right now. And it's just like, that is something we deserved to see. Mm -hmm. Lex getting even with Top Hat. I'm sure we all would have been happy to see Top Hat again. So for him to go on the side quest that we don't get to see, to just show up with Top Hat's motorbike, I just feel chipped, mm -hmm. to be honest. Like, what the... You know what would be amazing right now that I just thought about? So like you said, we didn't get to see this. This is totally a side quest. And we know that this tried video game is going to come out pretty soon. What if everything we just didn't see from the show is in the video game? Uh, if only. It would still annoy me. <laughs> it's just <laughs> retro ego. To like, oh yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm going to go and get even, even though we're on this important quest to find the antidote. And you're just abandoning Zandra and everyone else out in the open 
just to do this, just to satisfy yourself, not to do anything else. It's just to satisfy his own ego. Nah, it, it annoys me. <laughs> oh, I didn't say it doesn't annoy me. It's just that I don't expect better from Lex. No. I just don't feel like it has a good enough payoff for it. You know, with him just showing up with Top Hat's motorbike and scaring and his hat. the crazy kids away. And it's very, I mean, I, I love the whole melodrama that Lex, he's so performative. I get it. But um, I don't, I just didn't feel like that's a good enough payoff for the fact that he ran off to take care of this guy because he, what he did to his wife. And I'm like, I didn't even get to see it. I don't get to see Top Hat again. What the frick? I was wondering, like, was there an episode planned and they couldn't do it? So this is what we were stuck with. Like, I don't feel like this episode would be any different if we just skipped that whole part. You know, you could still have Lex and, you know, Ryan run off ahead. And then, you know, our mall rats feel like they're now things have gotten worse and they're wondering where Lex and Ryan is and Lex still shows up, you know, and that could have been cool. I just don't feel like we got a good payoff for the whole top hat thing. Mm. It wasn't good enough for me. So it's like, I kind of wish they just left it out, save it for season two. And then we could see top hat again. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> I don't right. like this. If only it had just been a deleted scene, then they could still put it up somewhere. Yeah, because it just feels a little like unnecessary to bring Top Hat back in and make us almost hope we get to see him again and we don't. And it's like you could have had you could have gotten the same thing you needed out of this episode without that. So mm. I'm just left feeling disappointed. I did like that the crazy kids instantly ran when they thought Top Hat was coming though. That's another thing, it kind of downplays Top Hat that Lex and Ryan were able to go get him. It yeah. was so easy, we didn't even need to see it. Like, what? Yeah, that's true. Mm. Come on, it's a top hat. I do feel like Ryan can beat anybody single-handedly. I do feel like he can beat most tribes single-handedly. <laughs> yeah, but when you, like, when, you have, when you have antagonists that are that great, that well-written, that much fun. Yeah, top hat deserves better. It. Yeah, we deserve to see them get taken uh, out. Agreed. You know, it's like, what if Zoot had just died in the background? Instead of seeing him die during a fight that he had with Lex, where he goes flying over a balcony, he deserved that kind of ending because of the fear he instilled in people. You know, he didn't deserve to die in a cutscene that we never get to see. So I feel like Top Hat deserved better than this. I wanted to see what happened between he and Lex. Lex yeah. and Ryan show up, they don't even have any bruises. Because yeah. <laughs> like, so? how on earth did they manage to steal everything, including Top Hat's hat? <laughs> If they just stolen his bike, fine. They might have stolen it, but his his hat. Yeah, we have to assume they stormed the casino, took care of all the guards, <laughs> like, <laughs> did whatever they did with Top Hat, and stole his bike and his hat. Like, yeah, that's. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, really? Come on, the circus deserved better than that. What if they caught him by surprise? Like he was like. <laughs> In the loo, and then he just left his hat on his bike. <laughs> and they just we don't go stole it. The tribe. We never, we never seen go to it. Totally fine if all he did was steal the bike and the hat and just, you know, manage to get in and out and do that. But I mean, why would he? So um, I just, I kind of wish I'd left it out and just had Lex and Ryan save the day a different way, mm -hmm. leave Top Hat at it, bring him back when you can actually do him a good service, you know, to his character. But I think at this point, they might have already known what, what was going to happen with Tondra, and they wanted Lex to show to her that, yeah, he, he took care of that. He got revenge for her. Okay, I'll buy that. I'll give you that. That's possible. They already knew they were going to kill off Zandra. And they wanted to give Lex a hero moment for his wife. I'll give you that. Yeah, that, that's the only reason I can think of. Still wanted to see it played out, though. Okay. <laughs> it would have been great if she would have burned a hat. <laughs> Just because I can't resist kicking a dead horse when he and Ryan are talking about their plan. Did you notice how many water bottles were in that locker? <laughs> and all I was thinking is, Lex, why, did you, only, why did you only use three to set up? Right. <laughs> like fucking all that water. All those water oh. bottles and the chocolates. <laughs> all that food, all that water, and you ah, use three to try and get rid of Bray. Sorry, couldn't help myself. We don't want plague carriers around here. Get back to the city where you belong. We're not plague carriers. 
We know about the virus. You're not coming through. Okay, so that brings us to our final thoughts of the episode. So finally out of the city, there is a palpable relief within the tribe as they continue on to Eagle Mountain. However, our Morats quickly come across a blockade. Um, yeah, Panel, what did you make of the final cliffhanger to this episode? Nice. Um, because, I mean, even though I have gone with these characters away from the mall and I know the dangers that are out there, uh, I was starting to feel that relief too. They're out of the city. No more locos. No more demon dogs. All we got to we just have a straight march to the mountains. And I was eager to find out what would be out there. And then this harsh reminder <laughs> of what could be out there. I also thought it was really smart to show that people in the countryside who stayed away from the city for various reasons would have found out that there's a you know an illness there and not want it in their neck of the woods and create a blockade. Like no, you aren't coming out here and spreading your diseases. I like that. I thought that was really clever yeah. and smart and actually quite threatening. Like, oh, this is a whole new ball game that we're dealing with. We've never been out here like this before. We don't know how they operate out here. They could slaughter us. They're, you know what I mean? We don't know what we're dealing with. I like that. Yeah. But I also felt like you guys could just get off the road and cut through the woods. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. That was a, one of my favorite cliffhangers from the entire series of them just walking up and them just seeing this kind of unknown tribe and you can kind of tell like oh no they're about to get mugged they're about to get like a huge a huge brawl is, is about to happen they're about to fight for their lives and yeah it was it was just a really good cliffhanger they're just standing there with you shall not pass <laughs> yeah <laughs> and it's accepted by, by the mole rats with a, oh um yeah so what do we do now we can't cross the road <laughs> But what were they protecting? What, what were they doing there? They're just protecting their neck of the woods. Like, this is something that would happen in any yeah. day and age. You know, a disease breaks out in the city, you'd quarantine the city. You'd be like, you're not leaving, you know, because you're not bringing the disease out into places where it wouldn't already be. And so I can totally see country kids yeah. being like, you're not coming out here, roaming our hills, and spreading your sickness out here where we could get it. You know, you take it right back to the city. <laughs> These things have happened in the past one and a half year, you know? S especially in, in the more rural areas where people have just closed off roads up to mountains. Yep, do not bring it up here. <laughs> yeah, stay away. Keep out. Yeah, I understand that completely. I, under I, I completely understand that. But at the same time, they should know... I don't know, I feel like... Alright, maybe they're not educated to know what a virus is and how it spreads... Uh, but I feel like if you know that the world had a virus and it wiped out all the adults, I'm sure every adult wasn't next to a group of people or a crowd of people. So they caught it eventually. Yeah, but it spreads from person but, to person to person. I get the logic okay, because if okay. I'm sitting in the country, we have not had any virus outbreaks. And they're mm -hmm. only, you're only hearing about them in the city. I would be like, you know what? I don't want, just don't bring it here. There's a chance we won't get it. Now, granted, you know, the virus killed everyone last time, but that doesn't change the way people's minds are going to work. You know, you got kids out in the streets stoning the infected, like as if that's going to help. <laughs> it's not going to save you, but they were doing it anyway. Um, yeah. People are still going to try to quarantine, even if it's like absolutely hopeless. They're going to try, you know, especially if they're thinking, we haven't had it out here. It's your city people, you know, it's the way you live. We don't want you bringing it to us, you know, so just don't bring it out here. Just keep it there. and Maybe it'll stay there, even if that's not factually accurate. That's just the way they're thinking, which is funny because later we'll find out there was they were right. Who was that tribe? Um, that any the, that isolation actually worked with this variant of the virus. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, first time it didn't. But this time, you know, we're going to find out that. These kids were onto something. Oh. Yeah, but keep in mind, for, first time around, the adults were still traveling the world. You know, people had already been places, been on planes, everything. And the point where the, these kids are, people don't just travel from area to area. Quarantine's a lot easier when yeah. there's nowhere to go. <laughs> there's nowhere to go, no yeah. reason to go there. Um, no way to get there. <laughs> I understand that, but... Yeah, okay, I won't argue it. <laughs> I feel like 
uh, I don't know. No, but I'm with you, Carlin. Like I do feel that considering what they have seen, I I don't know why people think that isolation is going to work. Like considering what they know, um, they shouldn't have any reason to believe that just hiding in the country will save you. But you know, if you're desperate, you'll try anything. Yeah, and keeping it at bay as long as possible is still a good goal. Yeah, that's what Ebony was doing. We'll just stay in the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. we'll do. It'll go away. <laughs> <laughs> It'll go away, or they'll all die, and then. Well, you know what? That's just that's just my problem with the city itself. The more I watch the season one, two, three, four, and five, the more I think that I would just leave the city because the, the inhabitants who live there are just stupid. <laughs> Preach, brother. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I would have been long gone. Yeah. <laughs> so. One of my in hindsight, Dale was right. <laughs> <laughs> Just leave. Why are you still there? I no longer believe in your cause. <laughs> Can't the dream stay alive somewhere else? Yeah, on top of a mountain, <laughs> a lovely forest, <laughs> an apple orchard. Yeah, it gets dragged back into the mall time and time again. <laughs> Apparently, that's the only place Ooh. the dream can <laughs> like for, come to fruition. <laughs> They have a boomerang around their neck. I wonder how isolated that little town was from season five. The one with, um... What, Liberty? Yeah, I wonder how isolated that place was. It didn't seem like too many people lived there at the time. Not open five. that can of worms right <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> nope, not going there. We're not at Liberty to speak about that. <laughs> and on that perfect note, that brings episode 51 to a close. Thank you very much to the panel, and we'll see you next time for the final finale. So until then, bye. Bye. Later days. Bye.